everybody. I'm Kate. Stephen. And we're going to be presenting Donut Economics to you together this morning. Stephen's going to pop on and off the stage at the critical moments that I need him. If you sit down there, and then I'll call you back. So, hi to everybody in the room. Hello to everybody on the live stream. I'm Kate. Um, as you might be able to imagine, I'm a little bit blown away completely that this is even happening. Um, thank you to Civic Square and Enroll Yourself and everybody who has enrolled themselves that this journey is even beginning. It's amazing to me. So I'm going to give an overview, a kind of whiz tour of Donut Economics. Over the next hour, we're going to explore some of the key ideas. I'm going to tell you a little bit about some of the places and ways it's being put into practice. And I know I'm going to be presenting a lot. I'm just going to say that up front. I know I'm going to be sharing a lot of ideas and it's just take it as a sort of flow of inspiration that you will then say, and what does this mean for me in the work I'm doing, where I'm doing the transformation I'm wanting to bring about? Because this is my one contribution to this journey, and I can't wait to come back and be sitting where you're sitting and hear your inspiration back in turn. So that lovely reciprocity. So I'll jump in here. Which way is forward? Ooh, not seeming to work. What's happening here? What am I pointing it at? Where? There? No, it's not happening. Oh, that's strange. Do you want to try it again? Oh, no. Okay. Oh, aha! You made it work. Thank you. Okay, so, back in the 1990s, I went to university and I studied economics because I thought this would give me the mother tongue of public policy. If I want to be part of changing the social injustice in the world, the environmental degradation. Surely, surely the language of economics is the language that you need to learn. And I was so frustrated by what I was taught. And I'm going to give you actually a whirlwind tour of three of the most important diagrams in economics. So whether you studied it or not, these diagrams are shaping the way we all think. Because even if you never actually sat in a lecture or classroom, you never opened a textbook, they are spoken every day in the news. They're spoken every day in Parliament, in public debate about the economy. And so we all start to take in the implicit ideas underlying it. The first one I'm going to come to is the first image. If you've ever sat in an economics class, the world over I ask people, what's the first diagram you ever remember learning? And it's this, supply and demand, right? It's the kind of the market. And that's an extraordinary thing. Day one of economics, which means... Ecos nomos, it means the art of household management. That's an amazing, noble, incredible thing to aspire to. Welcome to the art of household management, here's the market. And it puts the market at the centre of our vision. It means we make price the metric of concern, so suddenly we're already measuring everything in money. That's, that's a really specific move. And it means that anything that falls outside markets gets called an externality. That's what an economist will call anything. Like if you're a cyclist biking behind a car, the pollution in your face is an externality because you weren't part of that transaction of someone deciding to buy a car and pay for petrol. You're impacted by their choices, so it's an externality. Trouble with that is that we literally find ourselves in a world where the ongoing breakdown of the living world, climate breakdown, ecological breakdown, and extreme inequalities in the world, economists will say, well, that's, yeah, that's a, a, an environmental externality or a social externality. And you think, are we really going to call the most pressing crises that we face externalities? Doesn't that just tell us that our models aren't big enough, that they're not starting in the right place, so maybe we need to start somewhere else? Second diagram is a picture of humanity, right? Now, he's never actually drawn this character. It's the model of humanity that gets put at the heart of economics. And it's a character called Rational Economic Man. And students are taught the traits of this character. And actually, he's designed around what makes it really easy to make a model, that we could make a model and, and predict how people will behave. And that drives the character of humanity that's put at the heart of economics. He's never drawn, but I decided to do this portrait of him. That's what he would look like. He would be a man. He'd have no dependence, nobody, de nobody looking after, no one caring about totally self-isolated standing person, not affected by what other people think, apparently. He's got money in his hand because he interacts with the world through the market. He's got ego in his heart because he's 
driven by self-interest. They say, you know, we're, we're driven by self-interest and that's what makes us choose what we buy and sell in the world. He's got a calculator in his head because he's constantly calculating what's the, the best way to make the most money? What's the most utilitarian thing for me to do? He can never get enough. He's got insatiable wants and needs. And he knows the price of everything. The real danger of this character is that the more students in universities and schools are taught about this character, the more they come to say they actually admire and value his traits. So over time, students study economics, more value self-interest and competition. Yeah, these are really good skills in the economy, rather than collaboration and altruism. So who we tell ourselves we are shapes who we become. The models we make of ourselves actually remake us. And to me, that the value, such, so much of the value of what Civic Square is doing is showing us very different models of ourselves and different aspirations for who we can be, nurturing the best of our human nature. So we've got rational economic man there. And then the last one I'm going to show is the deep implicit shape of what progress looks like. And this is a shape that's never actually drawn in any textbook, but it so deeply underpins every conversation. It's already implanted in the back of our heads. And it's, oops. Sorry, there's rational economic man with nature at his feet. It's growth. It's endless growth. And you hear it. Yesterday, I had turned the news on. Oh, and in the last quarter, the, global econ the UK economy has grown by, what, you know, 2.3%, where it was only 0.9%. And it's just this sort of repetition of these stats about growth, as if progress, no matter how rich a nation already is, as if its progress lies endlessly in yet more growth. And there's something insane about believing that that's really going to be the metric of our success, growing endlessly, because nothing in nature survives and thrives that way. So I believe that these deep ideas that underpin mainstream economics and actually have really fueled the neoliberal economic agenda for the last 40 years have led us to some of the biggest crises that we face today. So if you just think how the 21st century has begun, began with financial meltdown in 2008. We're in an era of climate and ecological breakdown, the long, slow present of the now. We just lived through two years of COVID lockdown. And these crises may be reported differently in the news, but actually they're really deeply interconnected and they all tell us things about ourselves. They tell us that we are deeply interconnected with each other and with the rest of the living world that the impacts of these crises hit with huge inequalities of gender, of race, of wealth and power between the global north and the global south. And that these crises actually emerge from systems that are based on endless expansion. So if you have a global financial system that's endlessly aiming to expand because that's what it is doing, it creates a bubble that will burst. If we have a system using Earth's fossil fuels and resources endlessly extracting, we will induce climate and ecological breakdown. If we have a system of human settlements where we're endlessly pushing into areas of wildlife and couple that with ever-increasing global flights between places, we, we create perfect conditions for zoonotic disease transfer, picking up diseases from wildlife and then turning that into a global health pandemic. So there's something about that endless expansion that, that deeply undersits the, the sort of Western economic mindset that we've got to challenge and unpick. So I wanted to come up with a new model and a vision or possibility of reimagining what progress looks like, because it doesn't look like this. And this is where comes in that donut, the only one that does turn out to be good for us. Have, have the occasional one with icing, but make this your more regular one. And this is just one compass. I really like what Amy said. This is not the way, the only way. There's a lovely quote from a, a, a statistician called George Box. He said, all models are wrong, but some are useful. I find that really, really useful because all the models I'm going to show you, none of them are right, none of them are true, nothing's correct, it's a model. The question is, is it useful for the reality we think we face, for the values we hold and for the goals we have? Is it useful? And, and I invite you, just any model, whatever I show here or any model you create or encounter, it's not true and right, but is it useful and how is it useful and how could it be more useful and what else would be useful for us in what we're doing? So, Jeevan, come, come up here. Let's... Let's bring that donut, yep. Let's have a quick tour of the donut. Do you want to hop up on the chair so everyone can see you? You want to hold that up? So, so they can see you too? Hold it to one side, that's it. Right. Do you want to just tell people what, what, what 
What's the goal of the donut? Nice and loud. Stay inside the uh, middle of the hole and don't overshoot. That's it. So what you want to... Nobody... Fall in the hole. Nobody fall in the hole. Make sure you, nobody falls in the hole. Don't leave anybody behind in the hole. But also... Don't overshoot. Don't go outside the hole. Well, what happens if we go outside here? What are we doing? There's too much um, pollution and... Yeah. It hurts the planet, it doesn't hurts, it? Yeah, it hurts the planet. So, leave no one in the hole, but don't overshoot the limits. A round of applause for this. <laughs> well done. You jump down and I'll call you back up for the next one, okay? Brilliant. So, let's look. Let's just dive into that one level down. The goal here, if you think of humanity's use of Earth's resources radiating out from the middle of that picture... The hole in the middle, as Jeevan just said, that's a place where people are falling short on the essentials of life. They don't have the resources they need for health and education, food, decent housing, political voice, equality, income and work. And those dimensions, I crowdsourced those from the world's government. So in the Sustainable Development Goals, all the world's government said every person in the world has a claim to these essentials. I took the social ones and put them in the middle. It doesn't mean that the world's government's got it right, right? It's a model. It doesn't mean it's got everything in it. But the power of using that was that you can say to the world's governments, this is what you've already agreed, that every person in the world has a claim to all these essentials. This is pretty much uncontested. And this, of course, comes from a long history of human rights. So leave no one falling short on the essentials of life. But we do know that as we use Earth's resources to build buildings and light them and we provide flooring and materials and computers and clothing and we feed ourselves and we heat ourselves. We know that we're using Earth's resources. And so we get everyone over the social foundation and into that green ring, but there's also the risk that as we meet our needs and our wants, we start to put so much pressure on the life support systems of this planet that we can start to kick it out of balance. And that's where we go beyond that ecological ceiling. We can create climate breakdown because we emit too many greenhouse gas emissions. We withdraw too much water from lakes and rivers and we dry them up. We cut down too many forests. We create too many plastics and put our pollutants back into lakes and rivers and into the... And we know that our own bodies are full of microplastics. So out here, these are what's known as the nine planetary boundaries, which were first identified by Earth system scientists in 2009. They said, which is so recent, right? So recent. They said, we think there are nine life-supporting systems that keep this planet in an incredible, unusual, healthy, sweet spot that she's been in for the last 11,000 years. And if we overshoot those, we are at risk of pushing this planet out of balance. I think of it a bit like the human body. We know we've got a digestive system, a skeletal system, a muscular system, a nervous system, a respiratory system. And our health depends upon that delicate interaction of all of them. And if we go without food for too long, or we get too hot or too cold, or we get, carry too heavy things, we can damage any one of those systems, and that can kick us out of health. So from the human body and human health to the planetary body and planetary health, we need to live within these planetary boundaries. So that's the inside and the outside of the donut. Leave no one in the hole falling short in the essentials of life. Don't overshoot the planetary boundaries because that pushes us out of health. The sweet spot in between is a safe and just space for humanity. It's ecologically safe and it's socially just. So that's the vision of the donut. And once I'd drawn that, and, it, and I, that was, it was literally almost 10 years ago to the day that at Oxfam we published this as a discussion paper. It's like, oh, here's just an idea. This, is an, you know, this picture might be useful. And it had way more traction than I ever, ever imagined in the world. And I thought, wow, there's a power in pictures. Didn't realize that people would find that picture so empowering. And then I started to think, well, how have other cultures, indigenous cultures, other cultures around the world, depicted thriving and flourishing and well-being? And of course, for millennia, other cultures have known that that space of, sort of dynamic circle, there's something there about dynamism but circular and bounded whether it's the Taoist yin yang, the Maori takarangi, the turtle island medicine wheel, Celtic double spiral, the Buddhist endless knot, there's some deep wisdom 
in the way those shapes are drawn. And then you realize that the kind of Western growth curve is the, is the crazy outlier. And can we actually escape from that growth narrative and come back into something that's much more about being in balance? So the donut is, in a way, a really kind of Western thinking attempt to speak to something that's been known in other cultures for far, far longer. So if that's the vision. And let's imagine the donut is just a foundation for well-being. I like to sort of flip it flat like it's a plate. And then what could spiral out of it is intangibles of well-being. It's creativity, it's community, it's belonging, it's spirituality, it's... It's that sense of well-being if we do enable people to, to have the essential needs and live within the means of the planet. How can we make that uplift happen? Because if that's the goal, we are very, very far from it right now. It's all the red in this picture shows. So this is the global donut. We've got millions of people worldwide falling short on the essentials of life. If I shine here, that red wedge on food, that little wedge goes 11% of the way to the middle of the circle. Because 11% of people worldwide don't have enough food to eat every day. And you can see on every one of those social foundations, people in the world are falling short and cannot meet their most essential needs. And at the same time, we're already globally overshooting multiple planetary boundaries. Like here on greenhouse gas emissions, this ecological ceiling will be a bit at 350 parts per million of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. That's as high as it should go. If you've ever heard of the 350.org organization, that's that 350. It's there. But we know we're way over. We've, we've over-concentrated the atmosphere with carbon. We need to come back in. But also on biodiversity loss, we're losing far too many species and the integrity of their systems. Too much land conversion, too much fertilizer being leached out into lakes and rivers not taken up by plants, but going out into the water and killing off aquatic life. So we need to come back within those boundaries at the same time as meeting people's needs for the first time. We've got to do this from both sides, and that's the challenge, because economic development has never tried to do this before. The 20th century was very much about, let's grow our economies and we can meet everybody's needs. But now we know too much. We know that we are at risk of destroying the life support systems of our planetary home, so we have to do it in ways we've never done before. And that's the challenge, and that's the opportunity. This is a global donut. What happens if we bring it down to the level of nations? One of my colleagues, Andrew Fanning, and, and researchers at Leeds University, took this, took the best available global data, and then downscaled the donut for 150 countries. And this is what you get. Really different stories in different nations. So Malawi, what you can see is a country where people are living on around $1,000 per person per year. Of course, it's not that everyone has $1,000 per person per year, but the national income divided by the population, it's around $1,000 per person. A lot of human deprivation. A lot of people cannot meet their most essential needs, but the country is not at, the, at, at its share of the global scale putting anything of pressure on the planet. You've got China, the double whammy of falling short on people's needs and overshooting the planet. Here's the UK. Of course, we know there's a lot of deprivation in the UK, but here, what we can see on inequality, that's what's really showing up here. On a global scale, we are, of course, we are far better off than many, many people worldwide, but massively overshooting the planet. And then here, Canada. You know, we, these are two of the richest nations in the world on a global comparison. Really overshooting planetary boundaries. So for me, this says that there's no country in the world that say, yeah, we're a developed country. We're an advanced nation. There is nothing developed or advanced about overshooting planetary boundaries because we're running down the planet and undermining the prospects of people who depend upon a stable climate and fertile soils and healthy oceans to meet their own essential needs. So every nation is on a journey of transformation. If these look interesting to you or you have you know, kids and teachers, like that would be amazing in a school geography class, that website there, goodlife.leeds.ac.uk, wonderful source, like explore all these different countries. So every country is on a journey of transformation. What then must we do? Let's begin economics again. Let's start with models that are still not true and right and correct, but maybe more useful as a beginning point for the 21st century. So that's what I aim to do in donut economics. As Imi said, I, I read all the economics I was never taught, ecological and feminist and complexity, institutional, behavioral, and there were so many great ideas, I wanted to bring them together and make them dance on the same page. And so I started redrawing some of the pictures, thinking maybe this is a more useful beginning if we're going to try turn this story around. 
So one of the diagrams I start with is what I call the embedded economy diagram. And what this tells us is the economy is embedded in society. It is a social construct. It's just an invention of our relationships between ourselves. If we've invented it, we could reinvent it. We can reinvent those relationships and the laws and the regulations and the norms of how we interact. And society is embedded in the living world. We are part of nature and in relation to it and impacting on it all the time. And we're drawing in materials and matter. We're putting out waste and pollution. We're bathed in that river of solar energy. Energy coming in from the sun makes life happen and then bouncing back out into the universe. And we've got to be as ingenious as we can to harvest that energy from the sun. Let's zoom inside, though, and we see that within the economy, there's different ways that we meet our needs and wants. As I said, mainstream economics starts with the market. And who are we in that space? If we start with the market where you are a consumer or a producer, you're shopping or working or shopping or working, and then Karl Marx said, well, hang on, in the space of production, it really makes a difference where you're labor earning a wage or you're the owner, the capital owner, earning the profit. So that also matters. Who owns the means of production? That matters. So that's the market space. Then let's think about the state, because most mainstream economics says, oh, yeah, well, also the market, and sometimes we need the state, because the market, the market is brilliant, but it only serves those who can pay. The rest it ignores. And it only values what's priced, the rest it exploits. So we need the state as well. So we get the state, and in relation to the state, who might we be? You might be a public servant, a teacher, a doctor, a magistrate, a council worker. You might be a resident, as we all are, a resident of a place. You might be a voter or a protester. And these are all valuable roles we can play in relation to the state. Mainstream economics focuses on these two, the market and the state. And when we hear GDP reported, national income reported, it's counting the value of economic activity, goods bought and sold in the economy across these two. But it's only half the story. It's missing what runs down the middle. It's missing the fact that we all begin every day in a household as part of a family. Do you want to come and hold that up here? You come and hold that up here. Well, oh, that's it. Fantastic. Gee. You hold that up so everyone can see it. That's a little cutout version. That's right. So in a household where we start every day, as a parent, a partner, a relative, a child, raising kids, looking after our parents, that unpaid caring work that's traditionally been done by women that really gets labor, gets workers fresh and ready to go to work every day, but does all the underpinning of that. And then let's add the commons, where we come together, not through the market or the state, but as a community, co-creating goods and services we value. It might be a neighborhood garden on the corner of your block, it might be Wikipedia on the World Wide Web. It might be some amazing commons that, um, no doubt, there are plans and, and creations of commons in these groups here. So how can we be volunteers and sharers and co-creators and stewards? Let's hold that up. You hold that up. That's it. You take, 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 put that one down. Right? You hold this one up. So what the aim here, naming all of these roles, is to recognize that they call on different values in us and different skills in us. And mainstream economics told us, well, you should be competitive and self-interested and efficient, and then you'll do well in the market. But actually, we need to learn, again, to be co-creators and stewards and volunteers and sharers and collaborators. And of course, that is at the heart of this work. And what are the values and skills that will make that happen? How do we have our new relationship to the state? And how can the commons relate to the state? How do we make sure there's room for the household and that care that we all want to provide and it doesn't get squeezed out by the market? How can we weave these together? Because each one of us actually weaves through all of these roles every day. We are all of these people. How can we create neighborhoods and economies that enable us to be in all of these spaces? Thank you. Right, you jump down. Okay. COVID taught us one thing, that when the market space gets closed down due to the need for physical distancing, we see the state step in, and then we ask whose work is essential work. We see the household step in, sometimes with joy, sometimes under profound stress, providing that care, providing that homeschooling. And we see the commons step in, a community kitchen, a street WhatsApp group. We're looking out for each other, and, and surveys have found that people have said, one thing we don't want to lose when the COVID crisis is over is that sense of a we, because we're not that rational economic man. We're the most social of all mammals. We want to be together. 
We want to collaborate and share and look after each other. How can we ensure we don't lose that community sense? How can we nurture the best of human nature? So that's one big part of the story. And of course, finance sitting there in the middle, that's a big question. How can we make sure finance isn't in service to itself, but is actually in service to creating an economy that's in service to life, to human th flourishing and the living world? That is a transformation, a deep, hidden transformation of finance that needs to make this possible. Okay, so I'm going to go on to the next big idea, which is if we want to transform the future, we need to transform the dynamics. Jeevan, will you bring that piece of pipe? Not that one, the other one, the other one, the other one, yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's get these. Okay, you hop up on the chair. You hop up on the chair. Right. So we're going to talk about two fundamental dynamics that we need to transform. Okay? We have inherited degenerative linear industrial systems. You, you hold up, right? Jeevan here has the pipe of production. Here's the problem. This is the way that industrial society has been working for hundreds of years. We take Earth's materials. We take soil and timber and minerals and fish and animals and food and fiber. We stick it in the pipe of production. We make it into stuff we want. We use it often only once and we throw it away. And we lose that resource. We chuck it back into lakes and rivers. We emit carbon into the atmosphere. So it's a linear degenerative model of take make, use, lose. And that is pushing us over planetary boundaries when we take again and again and again from the Earth and we throw our waste again and again and again back into Earth sinks. We have to transform that dynamic. How are we going to do that? Do you even show me what you're going to do? He knows. <laughs> yeah, go on, go on, go on. So we have to turn that linear degenerative economy into a circular one. Hold it right up. Hold it right up for everybody. A circular one so that resources aren't used up. They go round and round. Do you want to do that with your finger? They go round and round and round so that waste from one process becomes food for the next process. That's one of the key ideas of a circular economy. In nature, there is no such thing as waste. And in fact, we're going to go one layer deeper here. We've got our... Right, you give me that one. One of the first things you want to do with a circular economy is recognize that there are two kinds of materials. There's the biological, nature's materials, food and fiber. And this is how nature works, right? Nature builds things up. Nature makes peacocks and daffodils and food and timber. And then they decompose and they rot and they turn back into the building blocks of life and then nature builds them up again. There is no waste. We see that fungus, the mycelium, we see scavengers, life continually creating conditions for life. How can we live in places that enable that loop to thrive and flow? So that's the biological materials. And then on this side, we've got what's called the technical materials, human-made materials. They may, have been, they may be resources that have been taken for nature, but they've been processed in ways that mean they can't just be put back. Plastics, ceramics, metals, synthetics, chemicals. And so we've got to try and mimic nature. We've got to try and mimic what nature's doing here by repairing and refurbishing and sharing and repurposing and upcycling and only ultimately recycling. But what we want to do, hold them nice and straight up, what we want to do is minimise what we take in from here, take as little new material as we can from the earth and lose as little as we can out the bottom so that we're maximizing what goes round and around these loops. And we're using renewable energy to make that. It takes a lot of energy. But then think of the jobs it creates. Think of the opportunities for local jobs in recycling and refurbishing and up, up, upscaling. Think of the creativity. What can this now become? What more could we do with this? What else could it become? So that's the potential from degenerative to regenerative. A round of applause for this young man. You hop down, you hop down, and the next one's the ball, okay? Not yet. Okay, so let's just look at a few examples from around the world. So landscapes, degenerative landscapes. How can we restore? Because actually we don't need to just cycle around and get round. We need to recognize we've run down the living systems. We need to repair them and restore them and renew so that nature comes back. This is the take, make, use, lose, and we dump our wastes into the neighborhoods of the world's poorest people. How do we turn that into a circular economy? Again, where we're repairing and refurbishing and reusing. 
total transformation of industry. In the space of cities and neighbourhoods, this is in downtown Seoul in Korea, there was a 10-lane highway, and they took it out and said, actually, that's been built over a stream. Let's bring, bring back that stream and bring nature to the heart of the city. A hospital in the UK, just no nature. Compare it to this one here in Singapore. There's so much research that shows that people get better faster when they can see a tree, when they feel that biophilia of the living world. How can we design and build places that actually make us feel healthy and alive? Second dynamic I'm going to come to. So, and I invite you to think of the degenerative to regenerative possibilities in your neighbourhood. And tomorrow, as you go on the workshops, what can you see already? That is it regenerative? Is it degenerative? How could that be transformed? Okay, second dynamic. Come on, bring that. Bring the, yeah, bring the best one. Yes, I peek at. Okay, so as long as as well as moving from degenerative to regenerative, we're recognising that we've inherited. Systems, whether through regulation, through privilege, inheritance, through social norms and structures that can tend to be divisive. Hold it, keep it together, keep it together, hold it up. So that it drives value and opportunity into the hands of a few. In fact, globally, the number of billionaires worldwide has doubled in the last decade, from a thousand billionaires to now over two thousand billionaires. Keep it small. And that pattern, we've, we're seeing it. Within countries, within neighbourhoods, we, we've all heard the news that you know, ten billionaires have doubled, more than doubled their wealth during COVID, and the owners of these massive corporations, whereas the 99% of people in the world are actually now worse off than they were before. Divisive systems divide us and push us so much further away from having the solution. They leave millions falling short on their essential needs, while others overconsume and overshoot the planet. We need to turn that divisive system. Into, oh yeah, beautiful. Do you want to get inside it? There we go. <laughs> into a distributive system, so that value and opportunity are shared far. Oh, at the top now, far more equitably with everybody. So, um, distributive systems that mean that the energy, the resources, the value, the opportunity is circulating, it's flowing, it's shared. And of course, a peer-to-peer -peer group is a beautiful example of being distributed by design. There's no one at the top. It's that it's that multi-directional relationship that makes it work. Brilliant. Can you get out again, though? That's the question. Yeah. Ace. Thank you, Jeevan. Round of applause. Okay, so some examples of distributed by design. And as I show these, think of the ones in your own neighborhood, in your own life, in our country, because there's so many more. So transport. Do we have private cars first, where you have to own a car to be able to get on the road, but actually it doesn't really work for anybody? Or do we have a system like this in Curitiba in Brazil? You have a dedicated highway for a bus. It's affordable. It's fast. It's public, it's shared, right? So how can we make transport accessible for everybody? Or here, this downtown Tokyo, reimagining, it's at the moment, the space is for cars. How can it be reimagined that the space is for community? And what possibilities of distributive design open up when you actually turn that space back to everyone? Examples from housing. This is a really interesting story from Bangkok. Many people emigra um, immigrating into the city, coming in, to, to find work in the city, building slum housing, not connecting as a community because they were continually facing outwards to go to work, built on government land. Many governments will come in and just destroy that housing. In Bangkok, they actually set up a program. So Ban Mankong means secure housing program. They said, OK, you're on this land. We're going to give you a long-term lease for this land, and we're going to actually give you money, funding as groups. We're going to get you into small groups, you have funds, you're going to work with architects and planners to design the housing that you want. And they turn that into this housing. So it, and, and it's community, it's commons-based housing. Really interesting example of the state working with the commons and the householders to actually come up with a solution that works for people. Another example is many people recognise that Airbnb is hiking up prices of flats and houses in many, many cities. What about if we have an example, something like Fair B&B, which is an alternative that's being set up. I, and I'm just showing one example. They say, if you, one, one member, one property. You don't 
own and control 10 properties. You rent out just your one property. So that's distributive by design already. And when you rent that property, 15% of the, the rental cost goes into one of three local projects. And as, as the renter, you can decide which local project you want it to go to. So you're reinvesting in community. Just a really nice tweak on something that's become massive that moves it from being that divisive to moves it in the direction of distributive. What other designs can we create that move things over this way? Neighborhoods in Atlanta, classic, famous American city for its urban sprawl, which means you have to drive everywhere to get anywhere. And of course, it separates people, whereas somewhere like Paris, many cities, really dense. Let's take advantage of the fact that it's dense. People can walk or bike everywhere. This idea of a 15-minute city or 15-minute neighborhood so that you could actually have everything that you need, a school and a park and your community cafe and your place of work within 15 minutes. So we don't have the big commute, we have multiple villages. How can that become real? London is known as the European capital of loneliness. People say they feel more lonely there than any other European city. How can places be designed like this intergenerational housing in Japan that actually recognize that elderly daycare can be combined with kindergarten and there's so much opportunity for joy and mutual learning and pleasure from those different age groups. So how can we design spaces that don't leave people feeling isolated and lonely? And then the last one in business. We've inherited a norm that thinks that business just is for making profits. Right? That's what business has, in the 20th century, largely been designed to do, to maximize returns to the owners of the company. That's just one design. It doesn't have to be like that. Why not have a company that's actually employee-owned? or that has a purpose, it's cooperatively owned, locally owned, community owned. So many other enterprise designs are possible. And lastly, why do we need the idea that production has to be controlled by global corporations that own the intellectual property and that then reap the value of those ideas? We can move to much more cosmolocal production like WikiHouse that has open source designs that are shared on the internet. Anybody can download and get that design and you can build your own house or desk or office or materials locally and I know that's a really big part of the Civic Square dream as well. And everyone's hearing from Alistair tomorrow morning. Everyone's hearing from Alistair tomorrow morning. So everyone when Alistair comes in the room say Cosmo Local Production <laughs> and he, he'll, he'll definitely be talking about that. Brilliant. So those are just lots of examples of distributive, so from divisive to distributive design. And I invite you to think, and where am I seeing this in my community, in my neighborhood, and what could we do? So I'm going to stop there. We've introduced the donut, haven't we, Jeevan? And we introduced the embedded economy, thinking about our many roles that we play in the economy and the, all, the importance of all those sectors. We've looked at the two fundamental dynamics, from degenerative to regenerative, from divisive to distributive. I'm going to invite you to take five minutes in twos or threes, just whoever's right around you, just chat what's coming up. And if you've got any questions or thoughts or anything that is, is driving you in an inquiry, write it down. And people from the Civic Square team will collect them up later. And that'll just be really great food for thought of what, what feels relevant. So you've got five minutes. What's this bringing up? I'm going to share a few more ideas. Um, just as... as, as uh, yeah, inspiration for the big journeys you're on. So I'm going to just step back and say everything that I've been sharing. Well, these ideas I wrote in the book, right? Donut Economics. It came out in 2017. And I started giving talks about the book. And what amazed me was afterwards people would come up and say, yeah, that's inspiring. And I'm doing it. I'm teaching that in my classroom. I'm a geography teacher. And I'm teaching that donut now on day one of the A-level. And it's not in the syllabus, but this is what the kids should be learning. And it's like, wow, these teachers just doing it. Community group, well, Imi, just, hello, we're a group in Birmingham, would you come and visit? You know, community groups, town councillors. I, can I, well, what would it mean to, to, to do this in my town or my city? People setting up social enterprises, and it was just this amazing inspiration of, wow, these ideas want to come off the page and actually go into practice. And there are people saying, oh, I'm already doing this. In fact, my favourite thing was a young woman came up to me once with a copy of my book. She said, would you sign this? Because my dad bought this book and he read it, and then he gave it to me. And he said, now I think I understand what it is you're doing with your life. <laughs> so it's like, donut as family therapy was <laughs> the best. But people said, I'm, I'm doing this. I'm, I'm working in a timber reclaim center or I'm setting up a social enterprise. And this really helps give like that a big umbrella framework to make sense of the things we're already doing. 
And that really massively inspired me. And so it made me realize this is calling for an organization. This is calling for a place where these people can connect. Because like, like Enroll Yourself, I believe that it's the peer-to-peer -peer inspiration that nothing else touches that. I can stand here and say, what if we were regenerative and distributed? But there's nothing like someone saying, yeah, and we're doing this in our community, in our neighborhood, and this is how we're putting it to practice. So we set up Donut Economics Action Lab. We're now a team of 10. We're online, so we're, we're based in different countries around the place. We meet on Zoom. It's a community platform, and I, my main message is I massively in, invite all of you to join the community of Donut Economics Action Lab. And you can do it just by going here, donateconomics.org. Check out the platform. There's news on it. Have a look around. There's all, the, all sorts of tools and introductions to Donut Economics. Ch take a look at the members. Become a member. And then also you can Google by, not Google, you can search by place and see who else is where you are. Other people who you might already know or you didn't know. Wow, who, who are these folks? They're all into this too and they live around the corner. And then there's stories and tools. We're, we're uploading tools. These, this is the way you could use these ideas in practice. It's all about taking the ideas off the page into action and practice. And then stories being shared back. That's the peer inspiration. That, I know, is what makes people think, wow, if they're doing that there, well, we, well, we can do the same. And, and we're seeing these amazing ripple effects. Somebody starts something and it just flies in other places. So I'm just going to share back some of the things that have really massively inspired me. It's that it's the, the what people do when you, when you say, here's an idea, innovate with it, adapt it, make it your own, and share back what happens. And it's the thrill of seeing teachers around the world saying, this is how I'm bringing it into my classroom. This, this is a class in the Netherlands. Teachers saying, well, they, they were short of teachers. And so they said, okay, we're going to do two things at once. We're going to come in as community volunteers for, for these months, and we're going to run Donut Fridays. And the kids are making their own homemade vegan donuts. They're bringing them in. So everyone's got a donut. They look happy. And then they're using the donut as an entry point to think about energy in their community, and they make it into a project. The kids go out into the community and interview people about energy and where we're getting our energy from here. So making it really action learning. A teacher in the Philippines working with university students doing downscale donuts of all sorts of different islands and parts of the Philippines. I mean, this A-level teacher in the UK getting his students to do a donut poster to present to their families. Just amazing stuff that teachers do because they have that initiative and momentum and they care and they want to innovate with their kids and they share back. Amazing games and ideas, some of them right from here. Beautiful ways of how can we actually make this into a play space? Can it be a card game, a board game, a game on the floor in the room? Just the games makers start showing up, and then you know you're, you're really lucky because the games, yeah, point to Zoya. The games makers start showing up and just bringing this art, and oh, and what else we can do? How, how this could be playful and in a physical space. The dancers start showing up. This is a group in Cali, Colombia, and another group in Cornwall that both just independently said, We're going to dance the donut. What does it mean to be outside the donut? What does it feel like if we're dancing to be in the donut? Whoop! Community groups show up from Rio to Reading to right here in Ladywood to um, Amsterdam. Just how can we turn this into exactly what's happening here? Community inspiration. How do we make this our own and actually put it into practice in ways that make sense for us? And like Amy said, what else do we want to mix this with? This doesn't have to stay just donut economics. Mix it with other ideas and inspirations that make sense to you. The designers show up. The urban planners, the, the architects, and they start, how can we embody this and make this real? So it's just so thrilling, all this stuff that people are bringing back. That's the inspiration. I'm going to share one of the key tools that I know you're going to be exploring tomorrow. So I'll just give a whiz overview of it, and I know you're going to dive in tomorrow. Ever since the donut was published 10 years ago, in 2012, people very quickly started saying, okay, that's a global story. How do we do it here? What would that mean? What would it mean to say, can we do this in our town or our city or our neighborhood or our nation? And we've recently created a tool that we think is a really, it's not the only one, it's not, all models are wrong, but some are useful. So we created a tool that we think is useful and we hope that you'll find it useful. So can, we, can our city, and I'm going to talk through the scale of a city because that's the way we've done a lot of this work, but I invite you to bring it right down to your house or your neighborhood or your street. That's the innovation you're going to add to it. How can our city live within the donut? Well, what we do is we unroll it. Open that space up, right? Let's make space for ourselves to dream in here. And we can dive in between the social foundation and the ecological ceiling and then turn it into a canvas for imagining and dreaming and creating that future that we want. 
like that. So we go inside. Here we are inside the donut. It's unrolled. And we've got our city, we've got here, the local, and we've got the world. So we're thinking both about here and our relationship to the whole world. And the question we ask, how can our city become a home to thriving people in a thriving place while respecting the well-being of all people and the health of the whole planet? So you can hear in that there's local aspirations to be thriving people in a thriving place. But we know we're connected to everywhere. So how do we do that in a way that respects the well-being of all people and the health of the whole planet? So I'm going to just dive us in. How can all the people of our city thrive? And how can our city be as generous as the wild land next door? I'm going to, I'm going to talk one, one layer further into each of those. How can our city respect the health of the whole planet and the well-being of all people? So let's dive in just one level below. Ooh, that white writing doesn't show up enough. That's something I'm learning. Okay, how can all the people of this place thrive? And that question can only be answered by the people of a place. It's a, a question that depends on the culture, the history, the diversity of people in the place. What does it mean for us to thrive here? That's our question. And what an amazing question to answer. How do we ensure that everyone's voice is being heard in that? How do we ensure that we're learning from what COVID made visible? It was always there, but now it's made visible. How do we now act on that? And what will turn out to be our secret strength? Right? Many places, as we need to pivot into a future, we need to draw on the strength and the value and the pride of what we have here and use that to pivot to a new future. So what is it in your place? Then we can go to the local ecological question. How can our place be as generous as the wild land next door? So wherever we are on earth, we could say, take me to the wild land next door. Like, what is the nearest healthy, natural habitat of this place. What would nature be doing here if we hadn't changed things? It can be really hard to find that land because we've changed almost everything. So where's the nearest healthy reference habitat? And what is nature doing there? Nature has a genius. Nature's generous. Nature stores carbon and welcomes wildlife and cycles water and harvests the sun's energy and makes us feel at home. And how can we use that is inspiration for the way we design our cities and neighborhoods. How can we too store carbon and, and cycle water and welcome wildlife and make ourselves feel at home? So how can we be as generous in our neighborhood as nature is in this place? That's a beautiful biomimicry idea from a, a thinker called Janine Benyus, who led this work and really inspired us to bring that in. So those are local aspirations, thriving people in a thriving place. And some of the, the, the most famous cities in the world have all that. Yeah, it's a great life here. It's got great Wi-Fi, great coffee. You can swim in the harbour. We've got clean, got clean air. We've got trees in the mountains. You know, I'm thinking of Nordic cities or Californian cities. Or, and, and, you know, we're doing well and, and it's a wonderful place to live. But every place is impacting on the rest of the world. And that's not such a great story. And that has to be taken into account as well. So how can our place be as... Oh, that's the wildland next door. Let me keep up with myself. How can our place respect the health of the whole planet? Let's think about all the things that we import into our cities and towns and neighborhoods. The food and the clothing, electronics, construction materials, household goods. And where, where have they come from? How have they been made? What pressure have they put on the planet? Pressure on the land, on people, on textiles and water, fertilizer, mining that's got a big carbon and material footprint. And, and as we saw, high income countries are way in overshoot and we need to come back within. So how can we decarbonize our transport and heating here? How can we turn wasteful economy into a circular one like Jeevan was beautifully showing us? How can we produce more locally to reduce that global impact? And how can we think about the pressure of our lifestyles on people everywhere? So that's the third lens, and then to the last, but by no means the least lens. How can we respect the well-being of all people? How are we connected to people everywhere? We're definitely connected through global supply chains. The products we buy, people stitch the clothes and pack the food and assemble our phones, and are their rights respected? We're connected through our lifestyles, because we know our, our lifestyles can have a big impact, and it causes climate breakdown that impacts on lives elsewhere. We're connected through culture to intercity and interneighborhood connections? Can we create opportunities and understanding and solidarity and empathy with others? How we connect is through our attitudes and our policies and our welcome to those who are arriving, whether as refugees or as migrants. How can we make this place welcoming and respectful and understanding? And how can we recognize that the policy regimes that we are all connected to, whether it's international trade rules or 
governments going to war or the, the, the governments that we vote for, what are they doing that's setting up the big rules? That can feel really tangential and remote and sometimes it suddenly feels really alive when we go on a march that says, you know, not in my name, not this war or against this trade rules and we realise we're part of big systems. How can we, through all of those, act here? What can we do here to improve and respect the rights and the impacts that we have on others? So those are the four lenses, and you can pull out, and I know that's a lot and it's complex. It's a lot, but it doesn't go away if we ignore it. So let's make it visible for ourselves. Let's go into it in ways that we find we can understand, that we can, we can make sense of for each other and with each other, and use this kind of space as a canvas for imagining the future. We, we started doing this work with cities um, in Portland, in Philadelphia, in Amsterdam, before COVID, and we just heard back from these city policymakers. The thrill of this is that we're actually talking across these, you know, I work on roads and you work on education. She works on water and I work on tax systems. But we, we come out of our silos and we actually talk about the whole system and see the inter interconnectedness of the whole. And the last idea I'm going to share is that these policymakers said, but if we're going to transform our cities and aim to get in the donut and become regenerative and distributive by design, we have to transform our own organizations. We have to transform the deep hidden design of how we work. So we started working with them saying, and they say, you know, we, we, we're told for decades to say, are we making our city grow? That's, that's the old metric of success. Is the city GDP growing? But we don't want to ask this question anymore because it's not actually delivering success in our, in our neighbors. This is not what makes people's lives thrive. We want to just go direct for how can we make our city thrive with new metrics and worldview and ideas about what that looks like. So what leaves some cities over here, some neighborhoods or businesses or community groups chasing the growth? And what has others dancing in this space of thriving? And we think there are five deep design traits we can all think about that help us dive below that surface. So I'm going to go flash through these five, okay? So purpose, networks, governance, ownership, and finance. What is your purpose? Why are we even here? What are we aiming at? And what would success like? The city of Amsterdam and in Melbourne, each in their own way. They use the donut, but you could use, you could use all sorts of tools. They use the donut to reimagine and restate their purpose. Amsterdam said, a thriving, inclusive, regenerative city for all residents while respecting the planetary boundaries. Well, that's a very different purpose from growing our GDP. And in Melbourne, they use the donut to have a mass community conversation about what would it mean to be a thriving, regenerative city. That's our own statement. So having a clear purpose. Networks, thinking about relationships, whether it's deepening deliberative democracy. This is in Japan. People wear these beautiful gowns to say, I'm a resident from 2060. And I stand and speak for the people of 2060 in this place. What if in your own communities you were to do that? What gown would you make? And what would you think and say and advocate differently if you were speaking not from 2022, but from 2060? Creating a circular city scan. What's the waste being created here? And how could it become food for the next process? And how can we hook these things up? How can we have citywide policy? Like in Ghent, they've got a really good citywide integrated policy around food systems. How can we use relationships and networks to start bringing about these changes? How can we think about governance? whether it's the rules, the hard rules that we set, whether it's really holistic, inclusive governance, or whether it's bringing clowns to mock people who break the traffic rules. It worked in Bogota, right? So all sorts of different ways. Who's got voice in decision-making? Who's in the room? Who's at the table? What are the metrics of success? Now let's go deeper. How do we think about who owns things here? Because how the sources of wealth creation are owned profoundly shapes what happens with the value that's created and where it goes and who gets to hold it. So in Vienna, over 60% of people live in publicly owned housing. It's owned by the city or housing co-ops because decades ago they decided that housing is a human right. It's not an investment option. It's a housing. It's a human right. Paris privatized water in the 80s, brought it back into public control because they realized this is a critical resource and the value from water should be reinvested in water, not going off to shareholders. Barcelona making sure that people have that sovereignty and control over their data. 
Atlanta has a great record of local entrepreneurship, of black-owned businesses, three times more than any other city in the US. Why? Because they made it happen, because we care about this. We want to invest in locally owned businesses. That money is a reinvested and enriches this community. So ownership, and then deep, of course, under that is finance. How is the budget harnessed in service of what we want? How can we use procurement as the city of Preston has done so well? I think Preston is like the UK's greatest export at the moment. People all over the world want to know what they're doing in Preston. Like, yay, Preston, let's make us proud. <laughs> using the budget they have, no money is coming in to save them, so they're using the budget they have to buy locally, buy from cooperatives, buy from locally, and, and they're, they're turning their economy around by the way they're purchasing locally, divesting from fossil fuels and from the future we know we don't want. So these are just examples, and you know there's many, many other things you could be bringing under these five design traits. The point is... We can take any organization and say, which of these design traits are drawing us back to that old economy that we don't want anymore? And which of them actually are already enabling us to pivot forward? And let's just recognize that every place, whether it's a neighborhood or a city, is embedded in bigger institutions. It's part of a nation, of a region, of the world. We don't control everything here. Let's just recognize we're not in control of everything here. If we were to put post-it notes all over this, they'd be everywhere. But then we can ask ourselves, and what can we stop doing now because we can? And what can we start doing now because we can? And what can we only do when we do it with others? And we need those networks. So we started doing this. This is with the, um, on, on a Miro board online with the city of Toronto. And we started just saying, look, let's just get this out of our systems. Put down everything that's stopping you. And they just went crazy with the red post-its. <laughs> so stopped. So, so, okay, right. Now, what can you already do tomorrow? What's the big blue sky thinking and what is already underway? And just the energy that you could feel even over Zoom, the energy of what's possible and seeing the deep design and people saying, we, know, we don't ever normally talk about this. Right? This is normally off the table because it's under the hood. Let's talk about it because it's the deep design that makes everything else possible. We also did a really playful version of it in Amsterdam. Um, and what it says above this one is, what are we going to stop, let go of and leave behind? What are we going to start, spread, and amplify? And this was with the Amsterdam Donut Coalition. So just showing that you can do it in so many different ways. So I'm going to pull back and say what I've shared with you here is this tool of unrolling the donut, diving into the four lenses, and you're going to be doing it tomorrow at the neighborhood scale. This has hardly been done before, this neighborhood scale. And that's what makes this, to me, so exciting. House, street, neighborhood. You folks, in all of your different places, in every different context that you're working, you're going to be innovating this. And what you share back, I promise you, what you share back will create so many ripples of inspiration. And even if you think, oh, it's too small to share back, it's not going to be too small to share back. Because somebody will see something in that and say, oh, I can take that and put that together with this other thing I'm doing. And so I can't wait to come back and sit where you're sitting and hear your stories sharing back of how this and other things you've taken and made it and, and amplified it and adapted it, but made it work where you are. And use those deep designs and think about what lies beneath and how we can profoundly change that too. So I'm going to end by saying I really welcome all of you. Please do join the DEAL community. We'd love to see you there. And please, as soon as you feel you have anything to share, if it's learning or if it's an innovation, it will inspire so many people. Peer-to-peer -peer inspiration is what makes this run. So I'll stop there. And I hope that all the ideas I've just shared there will pop up in amazing inspirations on the workshops tomorrow. Thank you so much.